Hello, it's Dr. J. I'm here in the computer lab that is primarily used by our Big City U uh, guests that uh, come here for the after school programs that uh, we are honored to host. And today we are on our eighth study of our seventh Good Woman in God's Word study. I hope you have an outline that you have downloaded uh, from the website or acquired in some way. You can always email me and I'll send you one happily. And uh, you can follow along as we go through this story of Ruth. Ruth is the eighth book in the Old Testament, and it takes place in the same time as the Judges. Our last study was on Deborah, who is one of the Judges. And in the early season of the time of the Judges is when Ruth's story emerges. Uh, really, the four chapters of the book of Ruth is about uh, the relationships that are bonded between Naomi and Ruth and Ruth and Boaz. Uh, and really a lot of the story is about courtship and ultimately their marriage. They go, Naomi, excuse me, Ruth and Boaz, from strangers to married with children, parents, uh, by the end of this, these four short chapters that make up their story. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about marriage. Uh, and it gives examples, and frankly, some examples are better than others, but we have a pretty good example here in Ruth and Boaz. So I want to kind of follow it uh, along the courtship line as, as we study uh, this dynamic of her story together. Uh, so I have here at the beginning the, the background that takes place. You know, in any romantic story, there's the background. Before boy meets girl, what is going on in their life? And the first chapter of Ruth is about the background, how Ruth is introduced into the story. And the first character on the scene, main character, really is not Ruth, but it is Naomi. And a sad thing that happens, a, a famine causes Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two boys to have to travel to a foreign land, to Moab, uh, just to survive in the midst of a famine. And it gets from bad to worse. You can pick up there at verse 3 on the top of your outline. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. This is sad. It's gone from, fa from famine to funerals here for, uh, her, for Naomi's husband, and the tragedy of tragedies, the deepest grief to to lose her own children. It is a very, very sad story. I, in the Bible, it's supposed to be uplifting our hearts, and here it's kind of down. But it gets better. Uh, have you ever watched the motion picture, the animated picture, Up? Uh, it starts sad. I dare anybody to watch the first 15 minutes of the movie Up and not cry. So, uh, But it gets better. And so that's kind of what happens uh, with Ruth uh, and Naomi and this story. Naomi does what people do in times of tragedy and grief. She goes home. And so she leaves Moab and Orpah and Ruth going with her, and they're headed back to her home, which is Bethlehem. Yes, that Bethlehem, the same Bethlehem that we know of from the Christmas story. She, she goes home, and when she uh, is traveling, there's conversations, these three widow women traveling together, three women, two generations, and Orpah and Ruth say, we're going to stay with you. And Naomi says, I have no future for you. Go back to your own land, marry husbands there, make a life there. You have no future with me that I can offer. Orpah eventually decides to go home, but Ruth uh, covenants that she will stay with Naomi. In, in her signature verse in the whole book, he, she says in verse 16 of chapter 1, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Uh, a lot of folks have that scripture either sung or perhaps read, uh, read at their wedding. Uh, the unity candle is sometimes called the Ruth candle, and I thought that's a fitting words of covenant of the two becoming one. Your people, my people, your God, my God. Where you go, I will go. Uh, and it fits in that context, but really it is the conversation between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law in the deep commitment. And we, we need to ponder a little bit about how deep of a transition Ruth is willing to make to go with Naomi. 
uh, not only to leave her homeland, it's the only place she had ever known, the only people that she had ever lived around there in the Moabites, but also for her to change her religion. Your God will be my God. I'm not going to follow the gods the Moabites did. I'm going to follow the God of the Hebrews. And we tip our hat to Naomi because I don't think Ruth would be willing to make that transition to say, I'm going to follow your God, unless Naomi had been such an outstanding example of what it means to follow the one true God. Now, by no means here, as we look at this sad background into Ruth's story, am I going to say that God caused a famine that set this into motion, or God caused uh, Elimelech or the two sons to pass away? Bad things happen, and God's not always behind it. But we do say that God uses even the bad things, and God can use what he does not choose. And so we find here God weaving a story out that is, he's, he's got a great plan for the future here. Uh, it starts in tragedy, but he, out of the tragedy, he's going to bring hope. That's the background of Ruth. Now, the background of, uh, uh, of Boaz is a little harder to determine. We don't know much about him. We find that he is a person who has means. He has property. Uh, he has people who work for him. He's a, a little older, uh, we know. But one of the things that we studied a couple of weeks ago that I hope you will note, I want to remember who Boaz's mother was. Who was Boaz's mother? It's in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, and it says that Boaz's mother was Rahab. Rahab the harlot, uh, part of the story of the walls of Jericho that came tumbling down. And she says, Rahab, I will join with the Hebrew people. I will be part of their faith. Uh, I will be part of their religion. And so she wasn't Jewish by bloodline, but she joined in with them. And I wonder this, and I gave you a blank there on your outline. Did having a mother who was a convert to Judaism make him, that's Boaz, more open to a Moabite wife? Because in the, the proud lineage of their culture, you know, say, oh, can't you find a good Jewish girl? And well, mom wasn't a good Jewish born girl. She uh, had joined the Hebrew faith after being from Jericho. And so maybe that made it open, uh, more likely of a courtship that others would not have, have smiled or looked as, as upon. Well, we kind of see here, even though they've never met, that God is setting up a story for them to meet. And this is a cool thing to think about the backgrounds of our marriages, that God is working to bring our lives together. My wife and I grew up on opposite sides of Knoxville, attending different churches, going to different schools, never met each other till we were in college together, and there we met. And we believe that somehow God was putting our stories, uh, even before we met together, so that we could have the marriage that we have, that it was God's will and it was God's orchestration taking place. A good practice for parents or grandparents with children, small children, is pray for their future spouse. You don't know where they are out there, but God does, and that he works in their lives to bring things together in a good and harmonious way. Uh, because in this background, uh, God is at work indeed. Well, finally, they do meet, and I call this a meeting of attraction. You know, we see signs on both sides that, that Ruth and Boaz meet each other. Naomi and Ruth get to Bethlehem, and everybody's glad to see Naomi. Welcome home, and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, because it's bitter, and we get the impression, of course. She's buried her husband, her two sons. She is bitter. She's broken. She's disappointed. She's discouraged and depressed. And so she kind of comes reclusive and stays in the home, but Ruth is one who has the, the foresight to know we've got to put food on the table, and she goes and participates in what was the method of caring for the impoverished in their day, that those who were collecting the grain in the fields wouldn't collect it all, and the impoverished could come around and collect up from what was left behind. And so it tells us <coughs> that Ruth finds her way, by the providence of God, into a field by, that was owned by Boaz. And when Boaz comes, he sees her there. Now, behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who is in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is that? Who is that lady out there? And uh, I think somewhere in his heart he's thinking too, 
she's pretty. <laughs> Something attractive uh, that he likes to her. And the foreman says, oh, this is uh, Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, the Moabite, who's come to help. And he's duly impressed by that. So that Boaz says to Ruth in the next verse, my daughter, let me pause there a moment, because uh, first time I've thought of this in reading this story, he calls her daughter. And it is thought that Boaz is somewhat older than Ruth, old enough to be her father. I don't know. Maybe it's just a, an expression of courtesy. My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. It's kind of, I like you. I want you to stay close. I don't want to lose you to somebody else's field. Uh, so we see, again, there's something of, of interest that is starting right there. And I didn't give you all the verses, but uh, time and again, Boaz does things uh, to kind of show his interest uh, and favorability toward uh, Ruth and hopefully kind of seeing like we can do sometimes when we're sweet on somebody and we want to see if they share uh, that kind of feeling toward us, uh, show some kindness and see how it is received. So he tells all of his workers, don't bother her. You know, a young, single Moabite woman uh, could have been taken advantage of, maybe with very few repercussions in that culture. So stay away from her. Uh, he gives Ruth permission to drink from the water supply that is given for his workers. They have a lunch together, kind of their first date, talk, get acquainted. He compliments her devotion to Naomi, and he quietly tells his workers, uh, when you're harvesting wheat, leave a little extra. Don't get as much as you usually do. Leave a little extra so she'll have an abundance to take home. So we see this attraction uh, that's going on, especially from Boaz toward, toward Ruth. And I, I put an expression here. I've heard this uh, about fledgling courtships before. Uh, there is heat, but is there fire? There's an attraction, uh, but is there something that will create a spark and be more than that? Well, the answer is yes, and we find that in the next part of it. The relationship gets serious and is moving toward marriage. When Ruth comes home, tells Naomi where she's been, who she met, Mr. Boaz, she's excited because she says, he's a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Well, what does that mean? In that time, if um, a man died, didn't have any offspring, uh, it would be okay for a relative of the deceased uh, to purchase and acquire all the property of the deceased person, including his family, and take them in his family, and that would be a way of giving grace and protection and supply uh, and livelihood for the women who needed a man in that culture to be taking care of them. And if it wasn't a father or husband, they didn't have a whole lot of other options. So here's a kinsman redeemer. The word redeem there means to take care of someone or something. They could take care of them if he would be willing to do that. Here's a, a way out of the predicament they have as two widows with not a lot of means uh, and strength to do much to make a livelihood for them. Now, the story goes on that Naomi decides to play matchmaker. And so she tells Ruth, uh, happened to know that Boaz is going to be on the threshing floor working late one night. And so she tells Ruth, I want you to go take a bath. I want you to put on some pretty perfume, fix your hair, get in your cleanest, nicest dress that you have, and go wait and watch. And when Boaz falls asleep, uh, go lay down next to him and uncover his feet. And so that is what happens. And the story picks up there at verse 7. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down by the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached him quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down in the middle of the night. Oh, excuse me, lay down. And in the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman at his feet. Uh, every bachelor's dream, you know, <laughs> taking place there. Uh, what a contrast. I thought of this again, that Boaz has been working there on the threshing floor. <coughs> he's hot. He's, he's sweaty. Uh, and then here comes Ruth, and she's as pretty as can be, and, and clean, and wearing her clean dress, and smelling sweet. What a contrast there. So he, he knows there's a lady there. He asks who it is. We can't appreciate how dark it gets when there's no electric lights around. And so kind of know what's, what's going on there. And who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread your corner over the, uh, of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. And he knows that she's a keeper. And Ruth really has been the one 
first to bring up the subject of a long-term relationship, of marriage. If you'll acquire a property, I'll marry you, we'll be a couple, and uh, all will work out well. And Boaz knows there's something special about this girl, and he says, Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You've not run after the younger man, whether poor, rich or poor. You could have had any young buck out there, but you chose me, this maybe grizzled old bachelor that said that uh, you would uh, let me be your husband and let me be a part of, of your family relationship. Uh, it's that kind of point, you know, where marriage comes up. We know now it's serious because uh, it's taken place. And in our culture, you know, the, uh, the, the man invites the woman, proposes to the woman to, to marry him. Will you marry me? But here it's, it's kind of like Ruth is taking the initiative here in bringing up the subject. It, it may be that uh, in your relationships and marriages out there that uh, it got started talking and sometimes the, the lady talks about it before the man does, uh, even though the proposal will ultimately come from the man. So we know that it's in courtship, the conversation going on uh, to marriage. Uh, I want to make a big point here about this evening that Boaz was, fill in the blank, a gentleman here. There is no dishonorable act that takes place that could have happened, did not happen uh, here. And he even takes the extra care to make sure that Ruth's reputation isn't tainted by people knowing that she was there. So she lay at his feet till morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor is watching out for her already, careful about her reputation and his full intention he gives that they would, uh, he would do what was necessary to make the marriage arrangement take place. That takes us to the third uh, part of the story. Yeah, the next part of the story, uh, there is a family involved. When you're courting somebody and when you're getting ready to marry somebody, there's a family, there are in-laws involved. And so before Ruth goes back home in those wee early hours. He said, bring me a shawl you are wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Take that back. Take it to Naomi. He wanted to make a good impression on her. Uh, the happiness and the joy and the fulfillment of this soon-to-be household is going to depend on her accepting him. And that goes with family. You know, we marry people, better or worse. Sometimes the families we marry into are part of the better. Uh, sadly, sometimes part of the worse. Uh, all the things you can do to make your in-laws favorable toward you are good investments. And so we kind of see that, that there's more involved just in the, the boy-girl because there are others that come along uh, with them in their, their siblings and their parents, family relationships that you get to, to share in. Next step, <coughs> make it legal. Now, we make a marriage is legal. You go to the courthouse and you get a marriage license. And when the marriage ceremony is over, the minister, the uh, efficient, signs it, gets a witness to sign it, and it's, and it's all legal. Uh, in this day, you went to the city gate and Boaz gets 10 witnesses because you want people to be clear of the intent and the deal and the covenant that is made. There won't be any question about that. And there was one relative uh, who was closer in, to the family than Boaz was and had the right of first refusal to buy the land, to marry Ruth, and to take on the family. And so he approaches him, Boaz does, and says, you know, this property of Elimelech is there and you can be the kinsman redeemer. And hey, real estate, he says, they're not making any more of it. I'll buy it. And then Boaz adds this. Uh, it's verse 5. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. Well, he backs out at that point. Uh, maybe he knew his wife wouldn't be crazy about him coming home with a new wife uh, in Ruth. Maybe he didn't want the financial responsibility of taking care of these two ladies. And so he says, no, you can take the purchase and you can do that. And so Boaz, to make it official there, Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. And I have also acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife. And he does two things just kind of interesting here to make it official. 
One is the one who had the right of first refusal and, and passed it on for Boaz to make the acquire the purchase of the land uh, and to marry Ruth. Uh, he takes his sandal off. He receives the other man's sandal. It's just kind of a, a symbolic thing. Uh, I read where it's because you stand on property. You know, there's there's real estate property involved. You stand on it's like this is yours. You can have it now. And so it's symbolic way you take your sandal off and hand it to him. And also he receives the affirmation of the witnesses. We got ten people. If there's any ever question about it, elders, respected people in the town saw what was made, understood the arrangements, and would stand by it. And so they say. Then the elders and all those at the gate, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Leah, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. And so uh, the blessing is there. The covenant is made. And the point I want to make about Boaz here, the extent and work he goes to make this arrangement and make it secure and to make it legal shows he is all in. He's all in. Uh, he is 100% behind this. Uh, this isn't something that he's half-hearted about. He's 100%. And I put a note there, good marriage is filled with 100% commitment. Don't let people tell you marriage is 50-50. Everybody's 50-50, my 50. No, marriage, a good marriage, two people, each one giving 100% of their effort. They're both all in, and that's the formula for a good and fruitful and rewarding, satisfying, meaningful marriage relationship. The next step then, that take care, celebrate the wedding. So it says, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And that's the wedding. Uh, I don't know if they had a, a big party. I don't know if it was small and intimate service. I don't know if there was singing and dancing and a big banquet like it seems to be in a lot of biblical weddings. Uh, there's a, no detail about it. Interesting, we get details about how they meet and their background. We get details about the, the courtship there and the arrangements that are made. But the wedding, it just they got married. They became married. But that's okay because there's no degrees of marriage. You're never half married. Uh, no matter how elaborate or how simple your wedding is, no matter if it goes according to plan or the wheels fall off of all your arrangements, at the end of the day, you're married, 100% married. There's not half married or fourth married. You're married, and so they are married. The real question then, we have questions, what was the wedding like? But the, the best question is, the only question is, who's the happiest, Ruth, Boaz, or Naomi? Because what had started as a very sad story has come to a happy story, which brings us to the, the last part of the story there in the ending verses. First comes love, then comes marriage, and then comes Boaz pushing a baby carriage. That's what happens next. The Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Ruth had been married before uh, in Moab, and they had not had children, uh, so Perhaps some divine intervention was necessary here that a child would come and they named the child Obed, who is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And David would be the second king of Israel. It was a royal line of Ruth and Boaz, the great grandparents of this great king uh, that would lead. And they didn't understand it or realize it at the time, but here was God orchestrating things in their story, in Ruth's story, uh, a Moabite woman, a foreigner, uh, to be involved in a story that eventually, of course, would bring the great story of salvation, because in that royal line, we start with David, and remember in the Christmas story, uh, the time I'm recording this is about Christmas time, so remember the Christmas story that, that, that Joseph and Mary go to Bethlehem because he was the house and lineage of David. And so we follow, follow that along in Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. So a thousand years after Boaz and Ruth have a child in Bethlehem, also in Bethlehem, a child is born. And just as Boaz and Ruth's child brought, brought hope and joy uh, and fulfillment, so also now this child is born. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, who gives to us hope and peace and joy. And he is our kinsman redeemer. He is the one that redeems us. He is the one that provides for us. He is the one God sent to take care 
of us. And so really the Ruth and Boaz story is a bit of a Christmas story because it's foretelling in Bethlehem this grand plan that God has for his son to come and be our kinsman redeemer, to be the one that provides for us what we could never provide for ourselves. In that we have hope in Jesus. And I hope you know that hope and celebrate that hope on this day and throughout eternity. Have a good day. We'll join with our next study.